a series called uh, Codex Rex, uh, the Book of the King. It's actually a manuscript that I've been writing for a while, and I'm posting uh, excerpts from that manuscript online as blogs, and I recommend you read them. Go to uh, zchurch.life, go up to the menu and pick blogs, and you'll find a lot of other good blogs there because everyone on our amazing Z team are excellent writers. We've got some great blogs. And uh, you need to check those out. But this series has to do with Jesus' lifestyle and how, how he lived, his home. And Jesus was not homeless. He was not a vagabond. He had a house. And you need to go back and catch the previous episode and give you a little background in this one. But he did have a house, and it was a rather large house. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Now, let me tell you something. It's difficult for people to receive this because of all the propaganda, all of our lives we've been taught that Jesus had no place to stay. Foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Uh, last year, Pastor Loretta was on the road for 10 months, and yet she has a beautiful place here in uh, Barcelona. She wasn't homeless. She was on the road. In 2008, uh, I was able to sleep in my bed six nights uh, because I was on the road. And there have been many times I've preached over 200 times a year. And uh, that meant I was living out of a suitcase. So because Jesus said he had no place to lay his head, he was referring to the fact that he was constantly on the move. Well, not continuously, but <laughs> the larger part of the time he was on the move. So Jesus was not homeless. He had a home. And we're going to talk about that. Praise God. Uh, in Matthew 4.12, it says that when Jesus heard that John was cast into prison, that he parted, departed into Galilee and leaving Nazareth. Now, Nazareth was where he lived with his mother and father. And he left Nazareth, and he came and dwelt in Capernaum. And that word dwelt means to, to place your permanent residence, uh, to, to move. Uh, well, let me just give you a definition. It means once and for all to set up to set up a fixed base. That's the meaning of dwelt in this case. So his fixed base was in Capernaum. Okay, you got that? He was not moving around from pillar to post. He had a place to go back to, his home. Now then, uh, Mark's gospel locates Jesus' uh, house on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. He could step outside of his house and, and see the fishermen tending to their nets. He was right there at a seaside villa. He had a king-sized palace. And this is going to blow your mind. Uh, and you've read it, but I, I want to take you through it just very slowly so you'll get it. Mark 5, 2, 15. And it came to pass that as Jesus sat at meat in his house. Notice the pronoun there, whose house? Didn't say his mama's house. Didn't say Peter's house. Didn't say, you know, uh, name anybody you want to. Dr. Luke, it was his house. Jesus sat at meat in his house. In other words, an organized meal. He sat at meat in his house. And many publicans and sinners sat also together with Jesus. Not a few. Many sat with Jesus in Jesus' house. He had seating for many people in his house, and he fed these many people in his house. He invited them into his house, and he fed them. Now, it doesn't stop there. And sinners, and also together with Jesus and his disciples. Here, here you have three groups of people. You have publicans, sinners, and Jesus' disciples. And actually, there's a fourth group, many other followers. And they sat at meat in his house. Now, how many disciples did Jesus have? 12? Well, what about the 70? We don't know if it was the 12 or the 70, but it was a big group. How about the 500? He had a, he had a group of 12. He had a group of 70. He had a group of 500. Could have been all of them wrapped up together. Many publicans, many sinners, his disciples, and many followers sat 
at meat in his house. It was an organized meal. They sat down at his house. In fact, uh, when he was holding court with these people, the publicans criticized him. They looked over and they saw him sitting with sinners and they said, why is he sitting with sinners? Isn't that something? They're in his house eating his food, enjoying his hospitality, and they're critical of what he's doing. And to this day, people are critical uh, of Jesus and, and they accuse him. Uh, and this is a derogatory of being homeless and being a vagabond. No, he was the prince of Israel. He built a home in Galilee. And you may ask, well, where is it? Well, they found a archaeological evidence of Peter's house. They think it's Peter's house. They found the foundation of a house uh, there in Capernaum, and there was uh, an inscription on one of the stones that said Peter. And so archaeologists have extrapolated that maybe that was Peter, St. Peter's house. May have been, may have not been. Uh, actually, I hope it wasn't. There are certain things that are supposed to remain hidden. If Jesus' house re remained today, it would be a shrine. People would idolize it and they'd fight wars over it. That's why no one's ever going to find the Ark of the Covenant. Sorry. No one is ever going to find uh, Noah's Ark. Sorry. No one's going to find Moses' bones. Sorry, because if they did, they would make idols out of them and build shrines around them and fight wars. And there are enough shrines in, in the holy city of Jerusalem right now. I mean... They have shrines on every corner where Jesus did something. And whether it happened or not, I don't know. People actually bow down and kiss the stones on the Via de la Rosa. But the Roman roads that Jesus walked on are actually 25 feet below the surface today. So none of those stones that people are kissing were stones that Jesus walked on. And that's what tradition does to people. It messes them up. Jesus said... You, you've made the power of God void through your traditions. And this tradition uh, of Jesus being homeless needs to be dealt with. Because when we recognize that he had something nice and he forfeited it for us, then it gives us the grounds to believe God through something nice. He had to have something before he could forfeit it. And he had to forfeit it before we could interpret it. That's the law of substitutionary sacrifice of Christ. He was a king. He forfeited his kingdom so that we could rule and reign. He was healthy and healed the sick, but he took our diseases so that we could walk in divine health. He was rich, yet he became poor at the cross of Calvary so that we, through his poverty, might be rich. You see, this, is, this falls in line with the substitutionary sacrifice. He had to have a house before he could give up a house. And because he gave up his home, then we can, claim, we can now today claim houses as our inheritance. Are you claiming yours? Well, you got to get this thing fixed. If you, if you think in the back of your mind that Jesus was poor, the servant is never greater than the master. So that means that you cannot believe God for prosperity if you were to be richer than Jesus. See where I'm going with that? Well, listen, I hope you got something out of it. We're going to continue in this vein for a while. So be back with me as often as you can and visit us at zchurch.life. God bless you. Cause sometimes the most beautiful things can be so simple.